Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. On today's show, joining us is Governor Doug Burgum of the state of North Dakota. Governor Burgum, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. Great to be with you. As we get started today, Governor, of course, we're, we're going to try to hit three big subjects, uh, the coronavirus, the economy, and then the unrest that's going on in our state and in the nation for that matter. But uh, so let's jump in and, and talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, the coronavirus first. Uh, you know, we're seeing numbers maybe encouraging in, in the state of North Dakota. Can you just kind of update uh, the audience out there of what's going on in our state? Well, the uh, numbers are very encouraging. And of course, the numbers include that uh, starts with great testing. And as you know, North Dakota has been among the leaders of all states in terms of amount of testing per capita. And as our testing has gone up, the percent of those tests that are actually positive is going down. So with more testing, we've got broader surveillance, we've got more confidence uh, in the accuracy of the numbers. Uh, and we're also with the great work of local public health uh, and individual responsibility, the citizens of North Dakota, when people are positive uh, and identified as positive, they're staying at home uh, and reducing and slowing the spread. Uh, and then our teams that are doing the contact tracing are finding out who those positives may have been exposed to, asking those folks to get tested or stay at home. And, and so we've really arrested the, the spread because of the great work that we're doing with the surveillance of the more broad spread testing and the contact tracing. And so that's great. And then we've, the whole purpose of this, when we were trying to uh, enter into an unknown pandemic was to preserve hospital capacity so that if people did get ill, because this is a disease that does have risk that spread very unevenly. If you're young and under 30 and healthy, uh, you may be positive with coronavirus and not even know it from a symptomatic standpoint, which is very different than the flu. When someone's got the flu, you know you've got the flu no matter what age you are because you feel awful. In this case, you could have it and not even know it. But we also have more clarity that if you are uh, elderly, uh, particularly if you're, you know, getting the age group of plus 70, plus 80. If you're in that age group and you've got underlying health, health problems, uh, it's going to be a very deadly disease. And so we, as we've said all along, we've got two missions. One is we have to save lives, particularly those are the most vulnerable. And then two, we've got to try to save livelihoods, which is, you know, how can we have the economy open and going and growing, but at the same time protect the most vulnerable. And so that's the, the dual mission that we're on. And uh, it doesn't happen unless the people of North Dakota care about themselves, their families, their neighbors and their communities. And I just have to say right off the bat, uh, you know, thank you, uh, it, you know, with deep gratitude to the people of North Dakota for, for, you know, coming through as they have Whatever the emergency is, whatever the crisis is, North Dakotans have come through it. Uh, we're coming through this one together, and I'm very optimistic about our, our, our future. Well, I appreciate, yeah, the, the, the optimism, but, but are you concerned and are your advisors maybe, what are they telling you um, about kind of the future spikes that might happen? I mean, different states are, have different things going on, and I assume uh, you talk to fellow governors out there, or at least watch that, so... Uh, what do you foresee for North Dakota? Well, one of the things that we're, you know, we look closely and we're in regular contact, both with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, with we weekly video calls uh, with, with that team, including the vice president and sometimes the president, uh, but all of the other leaders from uh, human services and uh, CMS and Dr. Burks and uh, Admiral Gerard and all the other leaders that are, that, we're all become sort of household names that are helping drive that. The access and availability to the governors has been uh, unparalleled. Uh, and then governors to governor talking to each other has also been, been very helpful. Uh, there's also been a lot of comparisons to say this is like the flu. And we know we have a flu season uh, in our country every year and the flu itself can be, uh, can be deadly uh, to those people that are that have uh, underlying health conditions and age. Uh, but this one, you know, is, is a little different. Everyone thought, oh, it's going to be like the flu. We're going to see it dissipate during the summer or maybe warmer weather. And, and here we have now, of a, we have 110 counties out of the over 3,100 counties in the United States that are experiencing outbreaks. Some of those uh, very strong outbreaks and some of those are occurring uh, in the, the, the southern part of our 
of our country where, you know, obviously it's even warmer there, there now than it is here and warm to maybe very hot. So again, given this is a new thing, uh, are those outbreaks occurring in areas of high population where people are now moving inside because of air conditioning, where maybe this winter they were more outside, now we're more outside, is it an inside outside as opposed to a, a weather related? So again, lots of things we're continuing to try to learn, but uh, we, we have to, you know, re again, remain, uh, make sure that we're staying, uh, as you say, on guard, uh, being you know, vigilant in terms of what we're doing about the North Dakota SMART guidelines, uh, not get complacent because uh, we know that this, uh, without a vaccine, it can come back. Uh, the other thing, which we're, which right now is we're, you know, we're congratulating ourselves for the great job we're doing, but we also acted very quickly. We closed schools. Uh, you know, the first case was on a Wednesday. We had a first press conference on Thursday morning. Many of the schools in the state were closed on Friday and we uh, because of vacation day, we, we closed the schools that Sunday. So we had kind of one day after one case, that's one of the fastest states to close down schools. That's 120,000 students going back to, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 families at night, uh, going back and forth from a congregate environment with, you know, joint cafeterias, uh, interacting with teachers, some of whom may be, you know, have be vulnerable to health. That wasn't going on. And then our university system, they were all on, on spring break and didn't come back. So we, from a timing standpoint here in North Dakota, we have not dealt with a pandemic when we've got 165,000 K-12 and university kids all interacting with each other every day in, in, in very, you know, whether sports and band and, and classrooms and with teachers. So that's another big thing that we got to get ready for is in the fall when we want to get people back into schools and, and resume that. But we're going to have, again, we have another reason we have to stay on guard is because that'll be a whole new dynamic in terms of the number of transmissible moments will go up by millions per day in North Dakota because you've got 145,000 people interacting with each other. Uh, you know, that alone we'll see. And we, and we, uh, other states are on the same kind of timetable. And so we, we will, we can't yet learn from other states on, on somebody else going to back to school first, because we'd like to be on the front end of that. So, so again, lots of things left to navigate as we go through this. Well, yeah. And, and in, in retrospect, of course, uh, you, you did things different than even governor Walsh in Minnesota. Uh, it, it can't, you know, cause you didn't do a strict shelter in place. Uh, was that due to numbers or wh how, were, how were those decisions made? Well, I think we were trying to take a look at what we called transmissible moments uh, because if you, you know, got farmers in North Dakota working in rural areas that had to get out and do spring work, whether they stayed at home or whether they got out in the field and did work, uh, they weren't gonna, there wasn't going to be a transmissible moment there. Uh, we knew by, by closing the schools, uh, the personal care businesses, uh, where people were in close contact for you know a 30 minute or hour long service like a haircut or a, a manicure or something by closing those transmissible moments uh, in the schools and then bars and restaurants uh, you know 93 percent of the jobs in north dakota remained open uh, we closed seven percent but we probably got rid of over half or more of the transmissible moments maybe we got rid of 75 percent of them so again it was that measured targeted approach uh, that we felt was the here and, and it worked. So, I mean, we, uh, and, uh, and again, we were relying heavily on, on the individual and collective responsibility of North Dakotans. But uh, I'd say that was a, you know, in the, everybody can second guess on Monday morning, but we were making decisions in real time with limited information, made it on the best data that we had at the time and pleased to say that uh, it, all of it worked very well so far. Well, I, and I agree, I think there was limited information and uh, we're learning every day, it seems like. But, you know, right now, businesses are reopening, uh, of course, now uh, quite a bit. Uh, but so what are you seeing? What are you hearing from those businesses as, as they're reopening? And are they following protocols? Well, I think one of the things that we're hearing is, uh, you know, some businesses have really thrived through all this because changes in consumer behavior. Uh, my understanding is, you know, very difficult uh, in North Dakota right now. If you want to go try to buy a, find someone to sell you a bicycle, they're out of them. Uh, you want to find camping gear, they're out of them. You know, RV sales, uh, so, some people reporting record sales, you know, for RVs because people are getting outdoors, uh, I would say getting back to nature, but, you know, doing things that they can do with their family. Uh, and of course, the flip side of that means if they're doing that means they might be 
you know, eating less in restaurants, uh, not staying in hotels, people aren't flying. I mean, the air, the air flight numbers are down. Uh, our, you know, tourism that we have in North Dakota this summer, uh, I think we're a state that people largely, people do drive here. We could see some big numbers this summer on that front. But if you're in the airline business or the hotel business, or the restaurant business, the thing you need right now is restoring consumer confidence. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we had pushed for a, a, a new grant program uh, for business resiliency where businesses in North Dakota can apply for grants. Uh, we at the emergency commission last week, we approved $63 million uh, in, in grants for businesses to apply uh, that could help do the things that help them make the permanent changes in their businesses that might, might help uh, restore confidence, whether that's adding you know, more outside seating uh, so you can get back to 100% occupancy numbers in terms of number of people you're serving, but do it in a less dense space, uh, or whether it's uh, businesses that may want to provide protection for their team members at a point like a checkout point in a restaurant or a gas station, uh, the, the shielding that would protect uh, those individuals who have to ha come into contact with large numbers of people during a day. Uh, you know, so it's, it, it's, you know, I think everything we can do to restore consumer confidence because there is actually a lot of money in the economy because of the federal stimulus checks, uh, the really generous unemployment programs, uh, the, the $1.9 billion that came uh, to, through the, uh, the, the payroll protection plan to the Department of Treasury, 1.9 billion just for North Dakota, 19,000 businesses. And that 1.9 billion in loans are actually forgivable uh, almost in their entirety under the new flexibility that's come out. So there's a lot of money in the economy. Uh, it's flowing towards, in some cases, new things uh, like uh, you know back to camping and biking and uh, outdoor exercise and maybe flowing away from others. So the, the economic stress is falling unevenly, but as we, we need to have consumer confidence restored to get people back in, uh, you know, restaurants, traditional retail shopping versus online uh, and get people uh, flying and traveling again. Well, and, and with that said, and people are trying to find a way to, to make their business work and to get it cranked up again. And, but how concerned are you and what are you hearing that, that a number of businesses uh, may go out of business? And of course that means those people will probably lose jobs. Well, I think one of the things that we'll have to sort through uh, when we take a look at, at businesses going out because people say, oh, you know, restaurant, so-and-so restaurant may be going out of business. If you look nationally at the statistics and the same for North Dakota, on any given year, when you're not having a pandemic, the most likely business to close is a restaurant and the most likely new business to open is a restaurant. Uh, it is a, you know, everybody eats and lots of people have an idea that their, their, their dream is to run a restaurant or start a restaurant. Uh, and, and so again, there traditionally is a lot of turnover. I expect this year there'll be more turnover in terms of on that, particularly on the restaurant front uh, because of the uh, pandemic where again, people are making choices. Uh, they're making a choice either, you know, eating at home or they're doing takeout. The restaurants, restaurants that change their business models to adopt to takeout, some of them have had uh, great success. And we also had reports, uh, you know, last weekend of last Saturday night across the state, there were some businesses that did a, as much sit down business in their restaurant as they would normally do on a Valentine's day, like one of the biggest dining days of the year. So there are some, are some bright spots. It's going to be uneven. The same with retail. Of course, if you were in the hardware business, the home and garden business, the sporting goods business, you are probably having a record May and June. Uh, if you were someone that was in clothing retail and didn't have a presence online, uh, including some of the national chains or local retailers, uh, that's been a that's been a tough uh, you know tough number of months uh, for those individuals. So again, just like the risk of the virus is spread unevenly across the population, uh, the economic hardship is also spread based on on uh, different business models. Well, let's turn uh, I guess to the oil industry for a moment. Of course. Uh, oil industries uh, prices have been way down. Now they rebounded a little bit. But so, what is the current state of the oil industry in North Dakota? Well, the oil industry uh, took a huge hit, and it took a huge hit before the coronavirus got to North Dakota. Because before the coronavirus got to North Dakota, uh, there was uh, travel bans that were being put on on international flights, uh, which caused a huge amount of demand destruction for. Uh, 
aviation fuel. Uh, then as states started to ripple in their stay at home orders, uh, corporations started saying people shouldn't travel, uh, you know, rental cars, you know, Rental cars numbers went down to their lowest number. Airline numbers went down to their you know lowest numbers. I mean, the miles driven in our country, uh, unbelievably, were were I think uh, during uh, some time there during the peak of this in April were as hadn't been that low since the 1960s. You know, and our population is uh, substantially higher as a country. The number of automobiles is substantially higher, and so for us to have miles driven. Uh, and down in those kinds of numbers, uh, you know, the number of cars that were just parked. Uh, I mean, you saw it here even in state government. There was a whole parking lot behind the, behind the Capitol with the state fleet where some of those cars didn't move for two months. And so the oil industry took this huge demand shock. Uh, prices collapsed. Uh, people started shutting in their wells. Uh, they stopped drilling new wells. So the number, the rig count in North Dakota is, you know, dropped to record low levels. But we are... <clears throat> Uh, starting to see that come back. And one of the great uh, actions that was taken uh, by the Industrial Commission uh, in recent weeks was the uh, approval of an abandoned well program. So we're actually taking some of the federal stimulus money uh, that was given through the Coronavirus Relief Fund and put together a program which is now being copied by other states, uh, but it was to have an opportunity to preserve anywhere between 500 and 800 jobs in the state of North Dakota among uh, you know, drilling crews and uh, reclamation crews and others. And we're going out and plugging abandoned wells. Some of them go back to the 50s and the 1980s, but these were abandoned wells, taking these dollars, plugging those wells, and then reclaiming the land. And some of this is in those oil fields up along the northern border, the Botno, Redenville County. Uh, there'll be over 2,200 acres of land that can be returned to, fun to farming. And so we're getting this done uh, normally, this would have been an impossible thing to do when the oil business is booming because the people that you need to do this work can get paid substantially more to work on new well completions or building new well pads. Uh, when the industry collapsed, a number of them are ready to leave the state and move back to Oklahoma or Texas. Now we've got an opportunity with this funding. We'll spend over $66 million uh, and, and on as many as 500 wells uh, that are going to be tackled where we can get take care of a... Uh, a, a longstanding, you know, industry and potential environmental challenge, uh, keep workforce here and have that workforce capability to be ready to go when oil prices go back and we start drilling new wells. So really innovative way to take this lull and go get some very important work done and keep the economy going and keep people working in North Dakota. Well, Governor, can, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're anticipating for the upcoming legislative season? With everything going on, I, I know you've been very busy, but I'm sure that uh, uh, budget people and departments are already starting to look towards uh, next year's and next two years budget. Well, we, they, they sure are looking ahead to budgets, John. And I want to say the first thing I want to say is, you know, special thank you to uh, Leader Chet Pollard and Leader Rich Wardner from the uh, House and Senate, respectively. But these two majority leaders uh, have been uh, fantastic uh, partners. Uh, to us throughout this whole thing. We've also been in regular touch with the minority leaders uh, as we've worked our way uh, through this challenge. And lots of uh, committee chairs and individual representatives have been uh, working with us as we uh, work through both the relief funds and get ready for, for next year. Uh, the, we've got some good news. The good news is uh, as we entered into this biennium, uh, our budget stabilization fund uh, was you know, it's going to be at its maximum. Uh, it is the highest it's ever been in the history of the state. It presently stands at $708 million in the, the rainy day or the budget stabilization fund. So that is all there. Uh, during the, the pandemic slowdown, I was talking about all those cars that were parked and travel curtailed. Uh, virtually every agency in the state is actually running below their spending, approved spending levels. And so we're saving some money uh, right now, even as we keep government uh, going and growing. The federal dollars that have come in to help us with uh, continuity of government have taken pressure off uh, some of the challenges in the budget we might have going forward. Uh, and because we had forecasted conservatively, uh, even with the downturn in revenue that we've seen in uh, March and April and May are, are through coming through the first 11 months of the 
24 month biennium, we're still $45 million ahead on our forecast. So we're at this moment in time, I don't know, there's probably a state in the nation that's ahead on forecast and has as big, a large a rainy day fund as, as a percentage of their general fund as the state of North Dakota does. And so we, again, we're well positioned, we're well prepared to manage through this, but as we've restarted all the strategic reviews that we had started before the pandemic with the agencies, we're asking people to take a look at how they can uh, reduce their budgets and at the same time, reduce your budgets, but let's figure out a way to serve the citizens even better. And some of that is with, with uh, the things that we're doing with technology, where if we can you know, get to a spot where you can renew your driver's license from home versus driving into a facility and taking a number and waiting for hours uh, to do that in a transaction person to person, uh, we can save the state money, we can save citizens time, uh, there's, so the, I, I'm excited about the transformative opportunities to improve government. But I'd say we're you know, well, well prepared, well positioned, uh, great relationship working with the legislature and we look forward to uh, you know, taking this transformative opportunity to, to make some long-term uh, beneficial improvements to how we deliver services going forward. Have you used any state reserve funds in support of the coronavirus? We haven't. The, uh, the emergency commission action has all been uh, taken out of, uh, primarily out of uh, one large bucket, which was there's 1.25, you know, so one and a quarter billion dollars that were given to the state of North Dakota through the original CARES Act funding uh, and the called the coronavirus uh, relief fund. And that, of that money, about two thirds of that has been, uh, been uh, approved and, and distributed. Uh, and that's going towards uh, you know, continuity of government, public health uh, and public safety. Uh, it, it's it's uh, being deployed in, in a very effective way. And, and so that's again, taking some pressure off. In addition to that, there was direct federal support for higher education, for K-12, uh, for public health. Uh, for all the hospitals in the state. Uh, and so there, and then again, every individual with all, nearly every individual in the state of North Dakota getting a check for $1,200 or more, plus the 1.9 billion that went to the 19,000 businesses in North Dakota. As I say, uh, even though the economy has slowed down, there is a lot of liquidity and a lot of dollars uh, in the economy right now. So the question is, you know, can we get the economy going and get those dollars flowing uh, you know, where we, we, we have, still have an opportunity to, to, to navigate our way, way through this with the unprecedented uh, federal stimulus money. Well, we, we want to switch real quick to, uh, of course, uh, the unrest that's going on around the area with the aftermath of the, the death of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis. Of course, crowds have gathered, maybe mostly in Fargo and North Dakota, but what's your impression of these protests and how they've been handled and uh, what do you think about the future of police department? Well, I think uh, relative to the protests that when the, the day that the outbreak, you know, they turned into, uh, you know, violence and, you know, vandalism, uh, I was uh, there uh, on the ground uh, in Fargo that day. And, and again, you are looking at a, you know, small minority of individuals out of all the people that were there uh, that were involved in that. So by and large, again, credit to North Dakotans and both uh, the marches and protests that happened before that and the ones that have happened since that one night. Again, it was a few hours on one night uh, where that occurred. Uh, we've, we again have had, you know, people coming forward expressing, uh, I think, you know, real pain, real concerns, uh, and, and people have been listening. I mean, credit to the, uh, the mayors and the local officials because these are, uh, many of the concerns are being expressed or need to be handled locally. Uh, you know, police forces, that's part of uh, city operations and we believe in local control. So again, credit to uh, all of the, uh, the Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo, mayors, county commissions, their police force, their, you know, the sheriff's department who've handled themselves with a lot of, uh, a lot of professionalism. I think from a state standpoint, we see this as a, a parallel. There's an opportunity when we took office, the Dakota Access Pipeline protests were happening. Uh, they were, you know, full on uh, at that time. And we were able to both uh, successfully and peacefully resolve those over the next 76 days. But we also began an initiative around tribal engagement where, uh, you know, many would say uh, that the, you know, tribal relations uh, 
between the state of North Dakota and the five sovereign nations with whom we share geography has never been better. So I, I think there's an opportunity here to really pursue the ideals of our country for liberty and justice for all uh, coming out of this. Uh, well, Governor, we got less than a minute now, but real quick, do you anticipate that schools will be back in person? And what, do you, what message can you give the citizens real quick? Well, we're working hard on that. Uh, I've got a K-12 coordinating uh, council meeting uh, right after I get off this interview. Uh, and we, by mid-July, we should have plans in place. And then again, it's going to depend a little bit on the virus. And it's gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be a component involving testing uh, to make sure we can safely return, just like we've talked about with long-term care. We want to lead, like we're leading the nation on visitation for long-term care, but doing it safely. We want to lead the nation on getting our schools going again, but do it in a way that's safe for all, including uh, you know, the teachers and the staff and administration that may be vulnerable adults. Finally, Governor, if people want more information, where can they go? Who can they contact? Well, ndresponse.gov is the website where you can go to that one spot and whether it's uh, public health or human services or our Commerce Department, uh, that's a good starting point. So ndresponse.gov. Uh, and again, thank, thanks to the citizens of North Dakota for the important role you've been playing through this whole emergency. Thank you for joining us today. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. Please stay safe, and as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the members of Prairie Public.